So we're going to um, continue talking about virtual memory. We're going to start getting into some of the more interesting details. Uh, I think that uh, next lecture, this and next lecture probably will be a little bit on the short side. So hopefully next lecture I can actually talk about some of the concurrency challenges and issues that you will likely run into with Pintos and implementing the virtual memory system. Uh, I feel bad that we're, talk we're going to be talking about that stuff partway through the project, like halfway through the project, but there's plenty of stuff you can actually work on that doesn't require you nailing down all the, the subtleties of concurrency for virtual memory. You can always just plop big giant locks in and require everything to be sequential uh, for various interactions and then increase the concurrency later if you designed your system carefully. So, um, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that uh, next lecture, hopefully toward the end. Um, but we did start talking about how the kernel manages virtual memory. We had this kind of supplemental page table thingy or virtual memory area descriptors depending on the operating system. Same concept in a lot of different OS's but you uh, see it given different names. So this is Linux's way of um, describing virtual memory areas and so you have uh, task struct is representative of a single user space thread which has a one-to-one -one correspondence to kernel threads in Linux and the PGD thing is the page directory so that's the top level of the two-level page table hierarchy on 32-bit Linux and an M map describes a memory map and guess what you can manipulate this memory map description with the mmap system call. So you can actually say I want to map this file into memory, I want to unmap this region, I want to map this as a, an anonymous area or whatever. You have a lot of power using mmap to do that kind of thing. Okay, so we talked about this, we talked about how this is used for resolving page faults because the processor has a very limited thing it can sort of say. You violated the the access constraints on the page, it's read only, you tried to write to it, or you tried to execute something that's not executable, or the page is not in memory. Those are the kinds of things that the CPU can report, and our abstraction is much more sophisticated than that, so we keep this information around, and uh, then we can use that to resolve faults properly. Okay. So there's various other things that we need to understand as well, though, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this today. Um, one is what page frames are available in the system and then a lot of details pertaining to the frames. Remember the frame is an actual page of physical memory where I could load a virtual page into or I could use it for a number of other ways and we'll talk about a few of those things. Uh, frames can be used by processes. They may be used by a physical device. Has anybody here tried to talk to a hard disk directly? I mean, not like, hello, hard disk, but uh, like tried to program it with ports. Yeah, kind of, maybe. Really? So 51 has you do ID directly. Um, and or 52, I mean. 52? So one of the projects is. Okay, so it's really interesting because when you program those devices directly, you, you can tell them, Here's the memory region where I want you to store data. And that happens to be a physical address. Well, the operating system has user processes that are working with virtual addresses. And so somehow the OS needs to coordinate what frames the, the disk controller writes into and make sure that they don't overlap what user processes are expecting to use and so forth. So there's a lot of details like that that need to be kept track of. Swap space. So we need to know what is the swap device or where can I store pages that I need to remove from their frames because I need to free up space for another process. So those are the kinds of things that need to be stored as well. <clears throat> okay. And of course pages can uh, be shared by processes. I can have a page as the Pintos documentation alludes to. I can be evicting a page and then some other processes, but wait, I want to use that page and now I have a concurrency issue. I might have a situation where I want to load a page and then that page immediately gets evicted. So there's all kinds of things that can happen um, because pages can be shared and frames also can be shared. So we need to think about these kinds of things. And we also talked a little bit about aliasing last time as well, which is really common 
when you have shared memory regions that only the process um, that's actually doing the accessing, only that page table records the accesses. Other page tables, which may point to the same frame, may actually uh, not get their bits updated. Yes? So, uh, that quick question about that aliasing thing. So is the kernel memory space only one gig? And like the user space is three gigs, and you need like a kernel memory address to access something? Doesn't that limit the total amount of system memory you have to the kernel memory space? Yeah, well, so... That's if you need to use a kernel address to access the page. So if you have, um, I mean, if it's, if it's something in user space that you want to access, then you just go ahead and access it because you're the kernel, or you can switch to that process's page table. Um, another thing that kernels can do is just map whatever physical page frame into its kernel address space and then just access it and then it could unmap it because again the kernel controls the page table mapping so um, as long as the kernel is careful about it, it it can change the mapping to whatever it needs to to access whatever physical page it wants to yeah okay let's see these are interesting questions um, yeah so the frame table keeps uh, track of the page frames and like I was mentioning, I may have frames being used for specific purposes, and I need to be able to record that kind of thing. So um, there's frames that are being used by the kernel itself, and that can change over time in a real operating system, like Linux, for example, with module loading and, and uh, unloading modules for the kernel. That can change the virtual memory configuration for the kernel. Uh, I was mentioning peripherals that write directly to memory regions. Typically they have to use physical addresses because if you think about the memory layout, and I don't think I have a picture in here, the, the peripheral typically is living out beyond the bridge between the processor and main memory. So the device is actually talking through, I think, um, so it's going to have some peripheral bus that it can use to access main memory, but it's all on the other side from the processor. So the processor's memory management unit is not involved in that memory access. And so the peripheral will typically be using physical uh, addresses instead of virtual ones. So frame tables describe those details. And you can have a lot of other useful things as well. Hint, hint, for Pintos, you might put a lock in there so that you can make sure that when a process, or I should say the kernel, is loading a page on behalf of a process, you can lock the frame so that nobody else can use it until you're done with it, and so forth. So you can have various details that can go into each entry for the frame table. Now you also need to know what's in use so that if I need a frame, I can go find one because it may be... Uh, the reality is that most operating systems are much more preemptive in managing virtual memory than Pintos will be. Okay? Because we're going to be doing pure demand paging, basically. And so that's the way that, um, that we're going to be doing it, but most operating systems don't. Most OSs will go and try to free up frames that haven't been used for a while so that it can have a pool of available frames. Or it will go, and if we have a lot of dirty pages, it'll go through and try to write them back so that it basically is trying to, to um, manage preemptively these resources in a more effective way. Oh yeah, and so what process or processes are using a frame? So in the case that I need to evict it, I need to go find all the processes that were utilizing it so that I can uh, make sure their page tables are updated properly. Where's the data from? So that if I need to... Yeah, this is one of the ones I'm, I'm going to spend some time talking about. That That's a very important question. Where the data is from tells me what I need to do when I evict the, the page. Is the page pinned? So it may be that I want to actually pin a page so that it can't be removed from memory. And uh, kernel pages are a really great example of that. If you have a non-paged kernel, then the kernel may pin all of its own pages so that they can't be paged out. That's a nice, simple approach. Or you may pin things like the page fault handler and a few other handlers, but everything else could be paged out if you want to be really fancy. Uh, same thing for uh, I.O. pages. Uh, you know, if you have a page that's being used by a device, typically you want to make sure that those pages are pinned so that they can't be uh, removed. Okay, so yeah, typically you pin things if they're being used for a long-running task. So uh, if some process wants to read data, let's say from a disk file that's really simple, or let's say it wants to write, uh, then the kernel goes ahead and sets up the DMA transfer. 
And it has a couple of choices. One thing it could do is say, well, process, you're going to be stuck for a while. You're not allowed to run while this goes on. So why don't I go ahead and configure your process address space so that the disk controller is writing directly into a page that will be visible in your memory. The process is blocked, so it doesn't care that the contents of the page are actually going to be changing at some unspecified point in the future. So if we're doing this, we need to make sure that those pages cannot be evicted because they're being used by the controller. <clears throat> now another option is interesting. It requires more resources, but it has other benefits. Is that we might actually say the kernel is going to retain its own I.O. buffers and we'll just do two copies. So now the DMA transfer goes into kernel managed pages. So they're the kernels. It doesn't give them up. <clears throat> and when the I.O. is complete, uh, the kernel will just copy those pages into the user process. So that's another option. And then it would reuse those uh, memory buffers for other transfers. Okay? And this is nice because now if the process is blocked, I can actually page the entire thing out of memory because the disk controller is not even writing into the process's address space anymore. I can just go ahead and remove it, and the kernel buffers will stay around. Okay. Um, big issue is the performance. A lot of time when operating systems try to be fast, the way they try to be fast is by copying data as little as possible. I don't know if you remember when we were talking about uh, microkernel architectures and passing these messages between processes using some IPC mechanism, and a lot of the approaches that were chosen to make things really fast was copy data as little as possible. So that automatically like sets off all kinds of warning bells for me uh, when you say, oh, we'll just copy data twice. Well, that's kind of slow, so we'd like to avoid doing that. Also, we're going to be using more virtual memory than we would like to, and, uh, and really I need to be careful when I say this because we're actually occupying page frames, and page frames are the limited resource that we actually want to manage because we, we don't mind saying you can have a ton of virtual memory pages, but it's the page frames that are limited and, and that uh, will constrain the system behavior. So those are some, some issues. Okay, yeah, so I already mentioned that kernels typically pin their own pages because um, most kernels don't uh, like to deal with paging just anything, so they need to be able to control what pages of the kernel are pinned. Uh, also, you have, sometimes have situations where the operating system can be, can be very unfair, and pinning actually can help you to avoid some fairness issues. So let's say that we have some kind of priority-based mechanism, which most schedulers have priority-based uh, mechanisms. And so you have a low-priority process that page faults, starts accessing the next page of the program, or it allocates space on the heap, and the kernel says, okay, you can have this page, and it accesses it and causes a fault. So the kernel starts loading that page into some frame. <clears throat> then else page gets finished loading, and so now the um, kernel moves that process back into the ready queue. Uh, but it won't necessarily get the CPU right away because it's low priority. And so let's say that what happens is something terribly unfair. A high priority process page faults as well. Okay, well... Um, unfortunately, now we may have to pick a, a page to evict, and guess what? The low priority process is lower priority than the high priority process, so let's take its thing. Okay. So um, this is the kind of situation that can be really kind of unfair and really bad, and so a kernel could easily resolve this by saying, any page that I load is pinned until the corresponding process gets to run. That would be an easy way of making this situation slightly less unfair. Okay. So basically you say, I just loaded this page on behalf of L. L hasn't had a chance to run yet, so L's page is pinned until I actually context switch to L. Yes? Do you have to implement pinning? The solution implementation doesn't implement pinning, so I don't think you strictly have to. I can't remember. You can if you'd like. Don't implement uh, kernel paging unless you're crazy and get it to work. Because um, there was one team I think I mentioned that tried to do it and they 
failed miserably. Most of their virtual memory system didn't work. And I was very nice to them, and I let them have a lot of points anyway, but I probably won't do that ever again. So if you do it, get it to work. Okay? Yes, was there another question? Uh, I was just saying, like, is it just hitting is kind of implemented by just never paging the internal stuff? Yes, basically you can you can do that. Well, I mean, as, as far as pinning kernel pages, yes, that's the way that you, you do it, is that you just never evict a kernel page, and you're done, right? And then the kernel never page faults unless you have a bug in the kernel. Uh, I should say a kernel address would never cause a page fault unless you have a bug in the kernel. You could still page fault in your system call code if you access a user page that's been evicted. So that's, that's going to be one of those interesting situations that you have to think about for your implementation is um, user process makes a system call and within the system call you get a page fault. How do you handle that? Okay, so you'll have to think about those kinds of situations. Uh, what else did I want to say about There was something else to say about that. I can't remember. Yeah, so um, another thing that you can do. So, so uh, where would pinning be useful uh, in situations where, for example, you're trying to load a page. So you, so you set aside a page frame to load a page into. And so you might do something like uh, pin that frame until the page is fully loaded. Um, that, that would be a simple way of, of resolving some of the issues that are talked about in Pintos. You can do the same thing with a lock. To say, well, I'm going to have a lock, I'm going to acquire the lock, and I'm not going to release the lock until the page is fully loaded and everything is configured and set up. So you can actually use locks to accomplish a similar thing. So I think that's why the so solution implementation doesn't use pinning. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, the only other thing that I wanted to mention about the slide is, okay, um, not only is it unfair to L that we load its page and then we immediately evict it, it's also a huge waste of time on behalf of the kernel. So if the kernel is loading a page and then evicting it to load some other page immediately, the first load was wasted. Wasted time. That's like millions of clocks that we just wasted. So there's not just fairness considerations here, there's also efficiency considerations. Okay. Uh, multiprocessor systems are always fun and exciting. I would love to have a multiprocessor OS um, for you guys to experiment with. Um, typically, you probably have seen symmetric multiprocessing systems where you have a bunch of CPUs and they all have their own caches, which makes cache coordination fun, unless you're the deck alpha and then you don't care. Um, and they all access some shared memory through a shared bus. Okay, so that's fine. It works pretty easy. It's, it's easy to understand and so forth. Typically the hardware takes care of a lot of concerns for you, like x86, IA32 is really friendly to applications written on these kinds of systems. And uh, you can see that, okay, so I have a little bit of a challenge here. Um, but as I add more CPUs, this stops working very well. Okay, so imagine 64 processors all on a single shared bus. Now we're sad. Okay? Or 256 processors on, all on a single shared bus. So, <clears throat> yeah, and, and like I say here, um, the typical reality is that these processors are running different programs and different programs don't normally share memory. Okay? That's why we like these systems. Or they're, they're easy to build, they're easy to program, and programs don't often share memory unless they're trying to coordinate some kind of computation, but most of the time they'll actually be doing their own computations because we'd like to avoid all the overhead of reading and writing the same shared memory. I don't know if you remember all of the issues we talk about in CS24 with ping-ponging and you know cache coordination overhead and, and so forth, uh, cache coherence protocols. So what you start seeing on larger systems is non-uniform memory access, aka NUMA. This is extremely common, and basically what you have in your computer system is clusters of processors that share memory. Okay, so you have a uniform memory access system, four processors sharing memory, and then another one, four processors sharing memory, and so forth. And they can also access non-local memory, 
And crazily enough, they can do it transparently using the page fault mechanism. So you can actually build very sophisticated things using the paging uh, mechanisms on the processor. But we have some kind of interconnect. So when a CPU in the first section wants to access memory in some other one, well, I can go ahead and move a copy of that page into the other cluster's memory, and then I can access it, but now I have to man manage the coordination manually. Okay? And so you can see that it becomes much slower to access some of that non-local memory transparently. So there's a lot of details that need to be shared with the operating system. And when you talk about, um, you know, we briefly talked about ACP, we talked briefly about the multiprocessor specification, and now UEFI. Well, one of the things that UEFI and all of that ACP configuration stuff will tell you is what are the various memory regions that are local versus non-local, so that you can actually tell what areas of memory you can access fast and what uh, areas of memory are much slower to access. And so the OS needs to be aware of this stuff that, so that it can make sure that, you know, it, it assigns memory to processes that uh, also um, are local to access. So you can actually start adding details like a processor affinity to page frames. Okay. I like, <laughs> you know, this, this page frame likes these processors because they're local. This, you know, and then um, obviously by extension, all the other processors are not local, so we really would like to not share that um, because it'll be a lot slower. <clears throat> now, hopefully one of the things that you think about when I describe this thing that we have some table that describes every page frame, now you're, hopefully you're thinking to yourself, okay, I've got 4 gigs of RAM or I've got 8 gigs of RAM, you know, that means I have a lot of pages, and now I'm saying that each page has some description, or I should say each frame has some description. Maybe it has a lock associated with it. Maybe it's got some way of representing what processes are using that frame, and so forth. That could really add up. And so it's right. You need to make sure that these things are as small as absolutely possible. Linux has a page data structure, which describes each page frame, and there are only 32 bytes, which if you look at, okay, 32 bytes for describing a 4 kilobyte page, or 4 kilobyte page frame, uh, thankfully I'm losing less than 1% of my memory to describing all of these things. And they are very careful about what they put into this data structure, and they're very careful about, uh, you know, any changes that might be introduced to it. You can imagine unions are very popular in this page descriptor based on configuration bits. This area might be used for one field or another field if they're mutually exclusive. That way they can make it as small as possible. Okay, and like I say here, um, how many page table entries reference the frame? That's useful. So if I know that nobody's referencing it, then it's available. If multiple page tables are referencing it, then it's a shared page and so forth. So there's various details that you can uh, infer from the details that are in these page descriptors. Another thing that's really interesting is that they do record what processes are using a given page frame. But the way that they do it is they have a reference or a pointer stored in the page descriptor that points to some higher level data structures that describe these details more efficiently. So, and they tend to be sparse because we, we want to make sure that all of this stuff is relatively uh, efficient to manage. And they tend to be data structures that you have to keep around anyway so that we don't really lose that much space. So anyway, um, that's one of the things that's really interesting. You can, I'm not going to describe this in much more detail, but you, um, if you have the book Understanding the Linux Kernel, it goes through describing how these things work, and it's really fascinating um, how they try to uh, describe all of these details that they need to keep track of and do it in an efficient way. Oh yes, question. Uh, is the Linux frame table not sparse? As far as I understand, it is not sparse. There's a there's a few reasons why. I mean, one is that uh, you know you want to be able to access it really quickly, and it's also really nice to be able to scan through it to find available frames to use. 
if you have a situation where you need to allocate a new frame to a process. So there's a couple of reasons why we like them to be dense. Um, but again, that's my best recollection. I looked at it a few years ago. I don't know if it's been, you know, a lot of the information in here is about Linux 2.6. And we've moved well past that, so I need to. Um, I should just give the caveat that this information may be out of date, and you should double check it if you're really curious. Okay. Otherwise, it's certainly representative of how these systems work. Okay, so um, pages and frames. Where does the page come from? This is kind of a really key detail because it dictates what we do when we evict pages. So, anonymous memory this is what happens when you malloc. And it says, okay, the process needs more data for its heap. That'll come from the anonymous memory file. If you uh, do a couple of other things, then uh, it will allocate from anonymous memory as well. Things like your stack pages. Stack, um, yeah, stack pages that are assigned to a process come from the anonymous uh, memory file. So basically, uh, contents don't come from a specific file system file. So it t tends to be initialized to zero because we want to make sure that the old frame's contents aren't uh, visible to other processes. Okay, so this is what I just said. And uh, so you say, okay, the anonymous memory, when I evict that page, what do I do with it? Because it's not backed by a file. Well, I need to store it somewhere, and so this kind of page will go into the uh, swap store because I need to be able to store it somewhere. So I store it into a swap page. Okay. Uh, it may also come from a memory map file. And again, this is where it gets a little bit complex because you could have a situation where the page is read-write. So when I modify the page, if I need to evict it, I can store it back in the file where it came from. Or I may have a situation where the backing file should remain read-only. And so if I need to swap that page out, it can't go back into the file because the file is supposed to be read-only as far as the process is concerned. So I may actually have to move that into the, um, a swap page as well. Okay. So yeah, they initially come from some part of a file in the file system. And this is very straightforward. This is the kind of thing uh, everyone will have to do for your... Pintos implementation, and you can actually look at process.c because it, it uh, has some examples of this in loading um, the ELF file format. So you say this is the start of the file, or this is the starting offset where I need to load this page's contents, this is the amount of data I need to load, and if it's less than four kilobytes and everything else is supposed to be zeros. Okay, So that kind of stuff is very easy to store for memory map files. And so when the page is evicted, you have to decide, does it go back to the file that it came from, or does it go into a swap slot? Okay. So uh, the example of a binary program, um, we probably would want to disallow writing to pages, but sometimes people like to write clever pieces of software that can actually write to binary files. Um, back when I was probably only three or four years into this job, uh, a student came and said, I want to write a Windows sandbox program. And the way that he did it was he would load the binary without running it, and then he would go in and modify system calls so that he could have his sandbox intercept all system calls. And then when a system call would occur, he would pop up a dialogue. Do you want to allow this system call? That was how he sandboxed the program. So you download some random thing off the internet, which says, I really, really promise I'm not going to steal all your bank account data, then you're protected from it. Okay? So things like that. So you could allow uh, writing to binary programs. You don't want it to go back to the file it came from. But in this case, uh, like I say here, if you have it read only all, all the way, then you can basically just throw out the page's contents and reload them from the original file. You don't actually have to store them in a swap slot because you know it's going to be stored on disk already in the original file. Okay, non-constant initialized data from a binary program. So this is an interesting one. Remember that ELF uh, files have .text, .ro data, that's read-only data. They have read-write data in .data. They have BSS, which is not actually represented in the file. So something in .data is initialized, but it's also writable. Well, in this case, I initially load this page's contents from the program file, 
But if I need to evict it, it may have been modified. In that case, I would have to store it in swap. Okay, so that's described there. A page of a data file mapped into memory. So now we're actually using mmap for reading and writing a data file as opposed to using read and write. Okay, so memory mapping is much faster because we cut down a copy of our data. We don't have to copy it as many times. So like you see here, the program intends to make changes to the data file and the program intends those changes to be written back to disk. So in this case, when I evict the page, because I need the frame, I go ahead and write it back to the file from which the page was taken. Okay. And like I say here, the OS may want to actually be more aggressive about this so that if the program crashes or other programs are looking at the file as well, they will see the changes to the file's contents uh, much more quickly. Okay, so those are a few little details here. Any questions about these examples? You will have to think about all of these for Project 5, pretty sure, except for the whole like writing to the binary thing, because I don't think you care about that. Okay, but you can see, you know, in your little page table description, in your supplemental page table, you can say, this is where the file's from, or I'm sorry, this is where the page's contents are from. It's anonymous or it's backed by this file from this starting uh, location and this length. Those kinds of details. When somebody calls mmap to memory map a file into uh, the process's address space, will you just go update that supplemental page table to say this is where this uh, memory is, is uh, mapped to? And in your page fault handler, you can look at that stuff and figure out, okay, I need to save back to the original file, I need to save to swap, or I can throw it away because the original file will be unchanged. So those are the kinds of things you have to think about. Okay, now I've already been talking about this, so you can see that uh, swap is going to be important. We have a swap partition or a swap file that we might use for storing these evicted pages. Partitions tend to be faster because file systems do add an overhead. Okay? I don't have a file system if I just have a whole array of pages that I want to store on my swap device. This is why Linux for a long time was like, use a swap partition because this will be the fastest way to do things. Okay, And uh, typically there is no internal fragmentation because you've got four kilobyte pages, you've got four kilobyte swap slots, it's uh, easy to store on current disks, so um, there is no internal fragmentation. But even if there was, you just reinitialize it every time the OS boots. That makes it nice and simple. The only problem with swap partitions is that it's harder to resize them. Okay, that's really the only thing that makes swap partitions unappealing. Um, but the nice thing is that all operating systems that support swap partitions just add another swap partition. Okay, that was easy. Uh, or you could create a larger swap partition and then throw away the old one. Most of these OSs support multiple swap partitions. Okay, the other thing. File systems frequently handle knowing where there's bad blocks. And swap partitions have to do that job manually because now we uh, have a situation where we don't have a file system but we may have bad sectors that we need to avoid. So um, yeah, so I already talked about this. Um, swap files, they tend to be stored in a very high level portion of the directory structure so that they're easy to access. The kernel can obviously cache details about where they're stored on disk so that they're fast to access. But they could also be fragmented, and so obviously that would be a file that the operating system kernel wants to make sure is not fragmented on the disk. Okay, so a few details about that. Let's see, yeah, Windows and OS X both have swap files. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, on a Mac has ever looked at private var VM, the giant file that is basically a virtual memory image. Every time you suspend your machine, that's where it ends up going. I would love to blow it away, but it it needs to be there. Okay, and Linux, of course, can use uh, either swap partitions or swap files. Let's see. So um, typically we call these things swap slots just because, you know, it's a slot where a virtual pages data can go. And so you need to be able to find a free slot. You need to be able to save the page to a slot. And you need to be able to load a page from a slot, possibly releasing it for someone else to use. And so you can see that there's a lot of places where arrays of values or even bitmaps can be really effective for this kind of thing. This is the way that Linux does it. It keeps track of basically is the slot available, 
If it has a number larger than one, then it is in use by multiple processes. Okay, so that's an easy way of telling if a particular slot holds a shared page. Uh, and there's a special value for representing bad slots, that it has errors when it tries to read or write that slot. Okay? So that's how Linux does this kind of thing. And so it can easily scan the swap map, uh, 32768. So let's say it's two bytes per entry. And so you can cram a whole bunch of those into a portion of your disk and just scan through them really quickly when you need to find a swap slot. Okay. Um, I think uh, the Pintos uh, Project 5 suggests bitmaps. There's a really complete bitmap implementation in the uh, kernel library code. It's very helpful for um, implementing a lot of these kinds of things. Um, so I would strongly suggest that you look at it in uh, your completion of Project 5. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so you can have many swap areas. The way that this is basically recorded is that we have 32 bits in our page table entries. And remember that when the present bit is zero, I can use the rest of it for myself. So 32-bit Linux has the first seven bits, being what swap area is it from. And then the rest of it is a slot index. And so you can see that uh, you have an absolutely obscene amount of swap space that you can access with this mechanism. And uh, you know, keeping in mind, of course, that we might also have stuff that is uh, backed by files and so forth, that obviously complicates this uh, to some extent. But still, it's, it's quite luxurious. And it becomes even more luxurious when you get into 64 bits, where you have even larger page table entries, where you can cram even more information. So, very scalable, very uh, effective mechanism to use. Yeah, so that's basically all the information that the page fault handler needs to pull that page back into memory. Any questions? Uh, you'll have to come up with some, some kind of uh, analogous mechanism for your virtual memory system. Uh, what do you store when the present bit is zero? Uh, there's a lot of interesting solutions people use. For example, if you know that all of your addresses to things in memory are D-word aligned, then the bottom bits are always zero. So you could actually cram a pointer <laughs> into that that points to some external data structure that says where to get things from. So there's a lot of interesting techniques you can actually use in your kernel. OK, page fault. So Linux page fault handler can easily use that to look things up. That's easy. Yeah, so allocate an unused frame from the frame table. Or if there's none available, then clearly you have to uh, evict somebody. Update the processes page table to refer to the frame. And load that page from disk into the frame. Okay. Now, obviously, the last two steps may occur in some other order. So you have to be, uh, you know, you have to figure out all the details there. But uh, that's basically what has to go on there. Okay, so um, any questions about any of this? This is obviously a lot of mechanism. <laughs> We're going to start talking about policy, which I think is far more exciting. Okay, this is tedious. You have to do it. It's necessary, but it's tedious. Okay, so um, there's a couple of important details that the virtual memory system has to figure out. Um, the first one is the obvious one. When I need a, a page frame to load a page into and no frames are available, because the kernel's hogging all its frames and, and user processes are, are all occupying other frames. How do I pick the page to evict? And that's the page replacement policy. The other one is more subtle, and it's one that I don't think you have to think about for your project, but real operating systems have to think about it. How many page frames should I allow processes to occupy? So that's the page allocation policy. So this is not saying how many pages can the process have. This is saying how many frames can the process have in memory. That's the distinction. And so the page allocation policy is an important detail to consider. We'll talk about that one next time. <clears throat> but the page replacement policy needs to think about page faults. I'd like to reduce page faults. And so there's a lot of different policies, and we need to be able to evaluate them. And so... One of the things that's really neat is that you can actually emulate programs and record their memory accesses. So you can actually get a sequence of memory accesses from programs executing, and you can use that to simulate policies to see how well they do. 
Okay? And like I said, you could generate them randomly, but remember that random memory accesses is terrible for caching, so programs don't ever do it, unless they're badly written. So uh, most of the time, uh, memory accesses follow very specific patterns. So we can simulate a page replacement policy against a sequence of memory accesses, and we should be able to see what its fault rate is. Okay, so uh, it can be verbose. This is a simple example that I just made up out of my head. And you can see that uh, we might have the sequence of addresses. We can shrink this in a couple of ways. First of all, all these accesses are going to fall within pages. So we don't care about the addresses. We care about the pages that they fall into. So let's say that, you know, again, for the sake of simplicity, that our pages are 100 bytes, and these are our addresses. Well, all we really need to do is throw away the bottom two digits. And now we have a sequence like this. Now you'll notice I have 14161111. Will 1111 usually generate page faults? There's no reason to, to keep track of 1111, because most of the time, those won't call it, cause faults. Now, they could in a high memory pressure situation where I have a lot of processes trying to use too much memory, uh, but in general we can ignore these safely. So we generate a final uh, memory access pattern like this. Okay. And hey look, it's very regular. Okay, so we call this a memory reference string and we can simulate policies against that reference string. So we also need to know how many page frames are available. That's also important for our analysis. And uh, I'm making a huge assumption, which one could argue with, which is that if I add page frames, I should see an improved hit rate. The f number of faults should decrease, or at least it shouldn't go up. Okay. Um, now, there's a lot of background here that we're sort of ignoring, but the reality is that <laughs> there are policies that actually have fault rates that go up as you increase the number of pages. That's really bad. We don't like policies that do that. Okay? We had actually has a name. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. Bellady or Bellady um, has uh, the anomaly named after him, which is that sometimes was for certain page replacement policies, as you increase the number of available frames, the fault rate sometimes goes up. We'd like to avoid that. So like I say, the ideal replacement policy will not suffer from this anomaly. And it, so it turns out that you can actually classify page replacement policies based on whether or not they have this anomaly, whether they exhibit this anomaly or not. Okay, so FIFO, really simple page replacement policy. We have a queue, and basically when we swap in a page, it goes on the back of the FIFO, and when I need to evict a page, I take the page that's on the front of the FIFO, so that's basically things march toward the front. Okay. And so you can see that I don't care at all whether the page was accessed. <laughs> I don't care whether it's dirty or not. I just pick the next one at the front of the FIFO. So very simplistic policy. I suppose the only one slightly better would be a random replacement policy where I just pick. And that's the one that's evicted. You could certainly implement that policy as well. That would be slightly simpler. Okay, so here's an example, reference string, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we're saying we have three page frames. And so we can simulate this. And you see that the first three accesses, since they're all different pages, because we eliminate duplicates anyway, we always get three faults. We can't avoid it. Now, unfortunately, the next access also is a fault. And then we go back and want to access page one again, but we only have three pages, so... Too bad, page one already got evicted. And <laughs> it just keeps going, right? We have a whole bunch of access. Finally, we access page one the third time, and it's in memory, so we're okay. We access it, page two, three generates a fault, four generates a fault, and five is still in memory, so we get no fault. Okay? This is bad. This is like, this makes me cry a little bit. Um, three quarters of our accesses generate faults. Now, some of them are unavoidable, but most of them, uh, most of the rest are just because of our policy. Does that make sense? Okay, this is how we can simulate policies. So let's increase our uh, memory to four frames. And we have the same reference string. So now we do one, two, three, four. We get four faults, which we can't avoid. 
Then we access page one. Yay, it's in there. Page two is in there. Yay. And then five generates a fault. And then we go through one, two, three, four, five, and we generate five more faults. So you can see that now we have 10 faults instead of nine. We added a, a page frame, and we got more faults. That is Bellati's anomaly. OK, any questions? Good, because I don't know that I could say much more than that. OK, now there is a policy, a, say a better policy. It is the best possible policy. That's why it's called the optimal policy, which basically is that we always evict a page that's going to be used furthest in the future. So if I have to choose of all the pages that I have, I always evict the one that I know I'm going to need furthest in the future. Okay. It does not suffer from this anomaly. When you add frames, the page fault rate never goes up. It either stays the same or goes down. The only problem is you have to actually know what your program is going to do in the future. And that turns out to be difficult. Okay? This is also why it's known as the clairvoyant page replacement policy, because you have to be clairvoyant to Im implement it. Okay? Now you might say, why in the world would I <laughs> even think about this optimal page rep uh, replacement policy that requires me to already know what my program is going to do? Why would I then need to run my program? Um, it turns out that you can try to approximate it in various ways, and you can measure other page replacement policies against the optimal policy. So you have your memory reference string, you simulate it uh, against the optimal policy, and you say, this is the best page fault rate I can possibly achieve, and this other page replacement policy comes within some percentage of achieving that. Okay. So we add this one. We'll just go through this really quickly, and this will be the last thing. Sequence of accesses. So yeah, this is the exact same reference string. Three page frames. Page, uh, the first three we can't avoid. Now we have an access to page four. We need to pick somebody to evict. So we look at the three that are in memory. One, two, and three. And we look at how long it's going to be before we access them. And we pick the one that's furthest in the future. So we evict page three in this situation. Then we access page one, page two. Those both are fine because our clairvoyant policy picked, uh, to keep those chose to keep those in memory. Uh, page five generates a fault. Again, we have to look at which page is accessed furthest in the future, and then we evict that one. And then we do one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So you can see here that we have seven faults. Okay, so already we're way better than FIFO which was nine for this situation. And if we add another frame to our memory, then we go ahead and do our thing. So the first four accesses are page faults, unavoidable. One, two will not generate faults. Now when we access page five, we gotta pick which page to evict. Four is access furthest in the future of the ones that were in memory, so we evict it. And then we do one, two, three, four generates a fault. And only page five will be accessed again, so we definitely don't evict page five, and we do that. So now instead of, what, what was it, seven, now we have six faults. Okay? So our anomaly doesn't appear with the optimal policy. Now obviously this is one example, we can't sort of conclude that therefore it's always correct, or all, you know never exhibits this anomaly, but there's a lot of theoretical uh, background information that we're completely glossing over that you can look into if you're curious. Okay, any questions? All right, so we already said the optimal policy is the best. We'd like to emulate it somehow. Clearly, um, we can't. Uh, so we have to you know, figure out some way of pretending like we're clairvoyant. And uh, the other thing is we have this Bellati's anomaly that we'd like to avoid. So what we'll do next time is finish up our discussion of various approaches that people have chosen to try to emulate this optimal replacement policy. So I'll see you all next time.